Chapter 15 Subbamma's Devotion There used to be a great devotee by name Karanam Subbamma in Puttaparthi. She was rich and noble in qualities. She had no children. Whatever she had, she used to give away in charity to one and all with the feeling, I am only sharing my God-given wealth with my fellow human beings. She used to spend her time with such sacred thoughts and equanimity. She always used to call me, Satya, Satya, and come near me. But I never went immediately to her house whenever she called me. Then she would plead with me in a humble tone, My dear, why don't you come to our house? I used to reply, I am not a beggar to come to your house without an invitation. If you call me, I will come. Otherwise, I won't. One day, Subbama called me and said, Raju, I have prepared dosas today. You kindly come to our house and partake of some. In those days, eatables like dosas and idlis were not available in everybody's house. Only some rich people used to prepare them in their houses. I told Subbama, I can't leave all these children and come alone to take dosas in your house. Poor lady. Then she prepared dosas for all the children. One day, all of us went to Subbama's house. She was a very pious housewife and a broad-minded lady. She felt a little embarrassed on seeing all the children, since she was not prepared for our visit. She therefore requested me, Raju, you have brought the children to my house. Very good. But I did not prepare and keep any item ready for the children. You please bring all these children tomorrow. I will prepare some eatables and keep them ready. The next day, she prepared the dish of my liking, namely, a soup made out of pitiki bedalu, a particular variety of pulse, Thaciolus radiatus. All the children, including myself, sat for lunch. I warned the children in advance. Subbama belongs to the Brahmin community. It is difficult for them to cast away the differences on account of caste and religion. Hence, keep some distance from her as far as possible. She brought some rice mixed with the soup in a vessel. She dropped morsel after morsel of this food in the hands of each of these boys. All of them ate to their heart's content. I was very happy on seeing the boys eating well. She realized the truth then that Raju would feel satisfied only when the children were fed well. That was why she fed the children first. Finally, a very small quantity of the food was left in the vessel. She was very unhappy that she could not provide enough quantity for me. She put in my mouth whatever little quantity of food was left over. And observing this, the children started whispering into one another's ears, why she fed only Raju in this manner, while putting the food into his mouth, whereas for all of us, she dropped it into our hands. I could gauge the situation. I told Subama, look, the children seem to be a bit agitated by your action. Subama then explained the whole matter in a beautiful way to the children thus. My dear children, it is not that I don't love you as much as I love Raju. In fact, Raju will feel happy and contented only when you eat first. Such is his love towards you. That is why I fed you first. Finally, only a little quantity of food was left over. It could not be made into morsels and dropped into Raju's hands one by one. That is why I put it into his mouth. Raju's nature is to satisfy others' hunger first. He feels satisfied when they eat fully. You cannot find even a trace of selfishness in Raju. You must also become like Raju. You must leave selfish interests, cultivate love and consider others' happiness as your happiness. Then only you will prosper, your future will be bright and your life will be an ideal to others. So saying, she diffused the situation tactfully, sending me on an errand to get some curry leaves. She told me, Raju, I will prepare some chitranam, a sort of rice preparation, 
for myself this evening. Please go and get some curry leaves from that tree. I was older in age to all the children gathered there, but I was shorter than all of them. However, I had the knack of climbing trees easily. I climbed the tree and collected some curry leaves as desired by Subumma. But do you know the actual reason why she sent me to bring the curry leaves? She took the opportunity to explain about my greatness and noble qualities to the children. She told them, My dear children, how fortunate you are to have Raju as your close friend. Raju is not an ordinary boy. He is king of kings. He will prove himself to be so in course of time. You obey his command implicitly. Never disobey his command under any circumstances. Never be angry with him. If you are angry with him, the devatas, gods, will be angry with you. You make him happy and derive happiness thereby. If Raju is dissatisfied for any reason, he will not disclose his feelings to anybody, but you will surely reap its consequences. Hence, always make Raju happy and keep him satisfied. Subbama's husband had a second wife by name Kamalamma. She approached Subbama and inquired, What, dear elder sister, how can these small children understand the philosophy you are teaching? Subbama replied to her query, saying, This is not philosophy, my dear younger sister. I am teaching these young children certain do's and don'ts to be observed by them in their day-to-day -day life. Since I have no children, I consider these children as my children. These boys move constantly with Raju, and Raju is my very life breath. One day, she prepared vadas in her house, but they were not sufficient in quantity to be served to all the children. Hence, she wanted to share some with me exclusively. She went near the window for the purpose. Her very next house belonged to the parents of this body. She called me through the window. Raju, Raju, please come here once. I went near the window. She tried to pass on through the window a small packet containing some vadas. Then I told her, Subama, it is not fair on your part to give vadas to me only, leaving the children. You must broaden your heart. Subama replied, Please excuse me for today, Raju. From tomorrow, I will distribute to all the children equally. I then took the vadas from her and distributed to all the children in small pieces in the evening. You cannot understand even one thousandth part of my loving nature, equal-mindedness and divinity. My love is expansive. However much you may try to describe it, it still becomes inadequate. Most people do not ever make any effort to understand my love. Loka samasta sukhino bhavantu Let the whole world be happy is my motto. All people must be happy. No one should undergo difficulties is my wish. The dropping down of the collar pin, leaving the school forever and the parents requesting me to come back to Puttaparthi these were all reasons which prompted me to come away from Urvakunda permanently. Since then, my glory has been increasing day by day. People from the neighboring villages started coming to Puttaparthi in large numbers in bullock carts to seek remedies for various types of ailments, mental and physical. They used to bring persons suffering from various types of mental diseases and those believed to be possessed by evil spirits and ghosts. They had great faith in me. It seems the devils and ghosts would leave if this boy orders them so. True to their faith, the moment such patients were brought to my presence, they were relieved of such afflictions. On witnessing this miracle, several people believed my words to be true. Venkama, the elder sister of this body, developed great faith in Sai Baba. She requested me, Satya, I want a photo of Sai Baba. Please give me one. Then I created one photo and gave it to her. 
she kept the photo with her till her last breath. The miraculous power of Sai has been growing day by day and hundreds of devotees from far and wide started visiting Puttaparthi every day. The people in the house could not make arrangements for their stay and food. Pedda Venkamaraju then requested the visiting devotees, Please come here only once a week, that is, on every Thursday. The devotees were very disappointed and agitated. They protested. How is it possible? How are we to wait till a Thursday? In the meanwhile, our suffering may turn serious. Our neighbor Subhama then intervened and suggested, Venkappa, your house cannot accommodate the hundreds of devotees visiting this boy daily. Please, therefore, send him to our house. I will look after the needs of this boy as well as the devotees visiting him. She also requested me, Swami, I don't have children. I consider service to the devotees as service to God. I shall cook food for all the devotees coming here and serve them. Kindly stay in our house only. From that day onwards, she used to cook food for all the devotees visiting me and serve them day and night. In fact, Subhama's love for me was more than what Yashoda had towards Krishna in the Krishnavatar. Ishwaramma and Subhama were neighbors and they had great love and affection for one another. But the men in the families were not on speaking terms with each other. Ishwaramma was not allowed to visit Subhama and she in turn was forbidden from visiting her neighbor. Hence, they both used to communicate with each other through the window. One day, I told Subhama, Subhama, you arranged to get one orange-colored gown stitched for me. She asked me, Swami, if you wish, you wear a dhoti. Why should you have to wear a gown? I replied, No, no. I am asking you to get one orange-colored gown since the time has come for me to wear ochre robes. She did not want to say no to Swami's instructions. She therefore got one gown stitched for me and brought it. The cost of the cloth for gown in those days was two annas. The stitching charge was one quarter of an anna, buttu. Thus, with two annas and a quarter, a gown was ready for me. As soon as I wore the gown, she called Ishwaramma. Ishwaramma came and shed tears on seeing me in those ochre robes. She said, What, Swami? Is it for witnessing this form you called me here? Enough! Enough! I convinced her, saying, It is only to remove the kashaya, evil feeling and bitterness, from the minds of the people that I wore this kashaya, ochre robe. Subhama belonged to the Brahmin caste, whereas this Sai Baba belonged to the Kshatriya caste. Hence, the entire Brahmin community in the village of Puttaparthi decided unanimously that since this lady has kept Sai Baba in her house, we should neither go to her house nor allow her to visit our house. Subhama was not bothered about their decision. She told her community people firmly, I don't need anybody, nor I need to visit anybody's house. You may do whatever you like. I will not leave this boy under any circumstances. She did not like to be away from Swami even for a moment. She used to treat Swami as her own child. With the result, the entire Brahmin community grudged against her. But Subhama did not budge an inch. She knew that she would have to face such difficulties in matters relating to spirituality. In a very short time, the number of people visiting me increased by leaps and bounds with the result, Subhama's house was also not sufficient to accommodate them. Observing the situation, Pedda Venkamaraju suggested to Subhama, Revered mother, why should you be inconvenienced on account of our boy? Hereafter, let us keep Satyam in a separate house. Subhama then donated a piece of land adjacent to the Venugopala Swami temple, where a small room was built exclusively for me. Subhama also donated some amount for the purpose. They used to keep me in that room and lock it from outside. Yet, 
I used to get away from there, somehow every now and then, and go to the nearby hill where I used to sit for long hours. Everyone wondered, how did this happen? The lock on the door is intact. Then, how could this boy come out? Such miracles were happening almost daily. One night, some people who disliked me locked the door of my room from outside and set it on fire. At that time, I was sleeping in that room. Also, some ten children were sleeping in the adjacent veranda. On seeing the flames, they started shouting, Raju! Raju! The door could not be opened since it was locked from outside. I opened the shutters of a small window from inside the room. The children saw me laughing. I tried to instill courage in them, saying, You don't worry at all. It is said, Dharmo Rakshati Rakshitaha. Since we are protecting Satya, truth, and Dharma, righteousness, they will in turn protect us. The children, however, got panicky. They just closed their eyes, shouting, Raju! Raju! In fact, that was the mantra they were chanting continuously. In the meanwhile, a number of people arrived there, fearing for my life. Venkama, Subama, Ishramma, and all the family members rushed there, crying. In a few seconds, there was a downpour. But surprisingly, there was no rain at all in any other place except that small hut. The flames died out on account of the heavy rain. Everyone was happy that Swami was safe. At the same time, they were sorry that some evil-minded and wicked people indulged in such a heinous act. Subama then got the lock broken and took me to her house. Subama liked Swami very much. In fact, Swami was a very life breath. The entire land in Puttaparthi used to be in her name in those days. She arranged for an inquiry to find out who was responsible for setting Swami's room on fire. Some five or six people were identified and were held in custody. She thundered, You wicked fellows! You should not remain in this village. Leave this village forthwith and go away. Then I pleaded with her holding her hands. Subama, they should not suffer on account of me. Knowingly or unknowingly, they committed a mistake. Please pardon them. Do not send them away from the village. They all came to me and carried me on their shoulders, profusely shedding tears of joy and repenting for their misdeed. The offenders included one Subana, who used to sell liquor, and one Ramana, besides some other people. They confessed, You must have acquired some great merit in some previous birth. Otherwise, such noble qualities would not have manifested in you. The village will earn great reputation in due course on account of you. Subama then declared, You consider this boy as an ordinary village urchin, but he is not. He is a thunderbolt, verily. From that day onwards, Subama did not allow me to go outside. She kept me in her own house. She was then sixty years old. She was always chanting my name. She would not sleep if I was not found in her vicinity. One day she called the mothers of the ten children, who used to be constantly in my company, and told them, From today, these children are not only yours, they also belong to me. All these children will be here with our Raju. Those ten friends were alive till very recently. You too know about Bukkapatnam Satyanarayana. He was my classmate. Several such people used to be in my company. One cannot describe how pure and unwavering their love was. Unfortunately, today evil intentions and bad thoughts are increasing in the children due to the effect of modern age. Bukkapatnam Satyanarayana was a good-natured person. One day, my shirt got torn. He saw the condition of the shirt. In those days, a piece of cloth sufficient for a pair of shirt and trousers used to cost only one and a half annas. He brought the cloth nicely packed in a paper and requested me, Raju, I have brought this cloth for you with great love. 
you must get a pair of shirt and trousers stitched out of the cloth. I refused the packet of cloth, saying, If you feel that the relationship between you and me must last forever, you should not offer this cloth to me. I will not even touch this packet. In fact, I have never taken even a paisa from anyone so far. I don't need anything. Whatever I need will come to me of its own. Hence, I have no necessity to stretch my hand before anybody. My hand is always above that of others. It is never below. This has been so right from my childhood and will continue to be so. I take pleasure in giving, not taking. Some jealous people may accuse me, saying that I have not given anything to them. But I do not give credence to such criticism. I have never hated or accused or derided anybody. I wish happiness even to those who deride me. There was another lady in the village who was the wife of a prominent person. She did not like Subama. She was angry that I was regularly going to the house of Subama and not visiting her house. She therefore decided, This boy must be killed somehow. One day she invited me, saying, My dear, today you must come to our house for breakfast. Don't tell this to anybody. You should come alone. I will prepare tasty wadas for you. She came to the house of Subama and requested, Subama, please send Raju to our house today for breakfast. But Subama did not like that idea. She suspected that that lady had an evil plan in her mind. She came to me and said, Raju, she is inviting you to her house with some evil intention. You please don't go. I was, however, determined to visit her house. I told Subama, Come what may, I must fulfill her wish. I went to her house. She prepared wadas mixed with poison and brought for my consumption. I knew they were mixed with poison, yet I ate them. Within five minutes, my blood was poisoned and the entire body turned blue. Some people who observed this rushed to the house of Subama and informed her and Ishwarama about the incident. They came running. I told them, You don't worry. She did what she wanted to. Now, I will do what I have to do. So saying, I asked them to bring some water in a tumbler. As soon as I took the tumbler in my hands, the entire quantity of water in it turned blue. Having come to know of the incident, the villagers attacked the house of that lady. Kondamaraju also became furious. He called some boyars, people belonging to the hunting community, and told them to teach a lesson to that lady. Then I went to Kondamaraju and gently told him, Grandfather, you are an elderly gentleman. You should not prompt them to do such things. It is not proper to indulge in violence against others, especially a lady. If anyone tries to harm her, I will leave this house and stay in her house only hereafter. Thus, it was only after coming out unscathed from several such tests that people started believing me as Sai Baba. In the meanwhile, one person started calling himself a devotee of Sai Baba. Yet some others imitated my hairstyle and started wearing a gown like me and called themselves Sai Baba. Is it possible to gain the confidence of people merely by adopting such tactics? Very soon, people realized their deceitful efforts. They came to know the truth. Gradually, eminent people like the Maharani of Mysore and some other big people started coming to Puttaparthi by car to see me. The Chitravati River was flowing perennially in those days. They used to park their cars on the other side of the river and come to Puttaparthi wading through knee-deep water. Thus, when devotees from far and wide started coming to Puttaparthi with great devotion to have my darshan, sparshan and sambhashan, none could create any more hurdles in the spread of my mission. The name and fame of Swami spread to far-off lands. After the death of her husband, Subama dedicated her entire life to Swami. Till her last breath, 
she spent her time in the service of Swami. In fact, there is a lot to be learned by you about her devotion and surrender to Swami. She used to provide free food to all the devotees visiting Swami. One day, we were traveling in a bullock cart. I asked her, Subama, what do you want? She hesitated a bit and looked this side and that side. Having realized that there was none nearby, she told me, Swami, I don't want anything. However, at the time of my departure from this earthly sojourn, please pour a few drops of water into my mouth with your divine hands. I promised her that I would certainly fulfill her request. The entire property of the village of Puttaparthi used to be in her name. She was the head of the entire village. Everyone in the village used to respect her. However, ever since she came into the fold of Swami, she had no other interest in life except Swami. Right from early morning till she went to bed, she was constantly engaged in Swami's work only. On certain occasions, I used to retire into the caves of the nearby hills without informing her. Poor lady, she would go round the hills in search of me. She used to pack upma, dosa, vada, idli, etc. in a tiffin carrier and come in search of me. At last, when she could find me, I used to inquire teasingly, Subama, what have you brought for me? And she used to reply, Swami, I have brought the items of your taste. Then I would tell her, Give me dosa. She would then serve dosa in a plate and hand it over to me. I used to tease her further, saying, Subama, I don't like this dosa. Give me idli, upma, vada, etc. Poor lady. She would then serve me all those items. From morning till evening, she busied herself preparing a number of items and waiting for me. Yet, she was anxious to know what more I needed. Once I told her, Subama, you need not feel anxious. I don't need anything. I put so many questions to you, asking for this and that, with a view to make your devotion and spirit of surrender known to the world. Subama then requested me, Swami, Please put a little quantity of the item you have tasted in my mouth. Then I took a little piece of idli from my plate and put it in her mouth with a little chutney. Thus, Subama experienced great bliss in the divine proximity of Swami till her last breath. A washerman of the village, Subana, was quite strong. Another person by name Subana, son of Chandrapa, was quite hefty with seven feet height. Subama imposed a condition that one of them should always accompany me. She told him, Baba sleeps in the mandir. He will be alone. One of you should always be there day and night by turn. He will also be going to the river whenever he pleases. He is a young boy. He cannot walk. Hence, you should carry him on your shoulders and take him wherever he wants. Thus, she used to make several arrangements for my convenience. She had a broad mind. Whatever she did, she did it to please Swami. The Harijans in the village had great liking for Swami. Every now and then, they used to take Swami to their houses. Subama also used to come to their houses along with me. One day, one Harijan by name Gangappa invited me for lunch in his house. I told Subama, that I was going to the house of Gangappa for lunch. Subama said that she would also come with me. I told her, I am going to take my lunch in the house of Harijan. You should not come. Subama insisted, saying, What, Swami? If you are going, why not I? I don't have such differences. I will also come. She came along with me. We took our lunch in that house. Gangapa was very much afraid of the consequences, saying, How did it happen? Subama, madam, had come to our house for lunch. I told him, You don't be afraid. You are Harijans, children of Lord Vishnu. Shed your differences of religion and caste 
and live happily with unity among all people. Thus, right from my childhood, I strove to remove such differences in the society. If I go on narrating like this, it will become a voluminous history. First and foremost, each one of you must cultivate love. The one devoid of love is equal to a dead body. Never keep yourself away from love under any circumstances. If not here today, you will have to think of me somewhere, sometime. Wherever you are, I have to come to your rescue. What is the use of not realizing this truth now and repenting later? Instead, realize the truth now itself and conduct yourself accordingly. Cultivate love. Realize the truth that love is our life and conduct yourself accordingly. When I was residing in the old mandir, we used to go to the Chitravati river daily. All the children in the village would accompany me. One boy would ask for a pencil, while another a pen. Since they were children, they used to ask for such articles. I used to tell them, make a heap of sand and search for the article of your choice in that heap. They got in that sand whatever they wanted. One day, we were returning from the Chitravati river to the old mandir. Sushilamma and her sister Kumaramma, the author of the book Anyatha Sharanam Nasti, ran in advance to the mandir with a view to make arrangements for giving Arthi, waving lighted camphor, to Swami. Then, I made a signal to Subhama to stop these two ladies. I told her, You go to the mandir first. Then, she stopped them and said, you stay here itself. I will go in advance. The two sisters wondered. Subama is a widow. How can she give Arthi to Swami? When Subama reached the entrance door of the old mandir, she found a big snake there. Subama used to look after everything in the mandir carefully. She addressed the snake as Sai Nageshwara, Sai Nageshwara, in a loud voice. In the meanwhile, all people came running to that place. Subama said to herself, Swami says, God is imminent in every living being. Therefore, this snake should not be beaten or killed. She held the snake courageously with her hand. Immediately, it coiled round her hand instead of biting her. Soon I reached that place. I jocularly inquired, Subama, are you playing with the snake? She replied, Swami, is it not for rescuing those ladies that you sent me here in advance? Thus, Subama was a witness to several such miracles. She was a noble, pious and a very fortunate lady. She did great service to me right from the beginning. Not only to me, she used to cook food for all the devotees visiting me. With the result, all her relatives grudged against her. But she did not care. She used to declare, I don't need anybody. It is enough if only Swami is by my side. Whatever he says, I will obey implicitly. She had such firm faith in Swami. One day I inquired, Subama, would you like to see your late husband? I used to cut jokes with her like that now and then as her husband had already died. She replied, Swami, I have no such desires. What connection do I have with a person who is no more? He was not destined to witness your glory. Therefore, he died. I have the good fortune. Hence, I am able to serve you. But I prompted her a little more to agree to my suggestion. I told her, If you wish to see him just once, you may do so. You will be relieved of that obligation as well. I told her to go out into the backyard of her house and watch. There was a drumstick tree. Subama witnessed the scene wherein her husband, the late Narayana Rao, was sitting under the tree and smoking a cigarette. She was happy to see her late husband in flesh and blood again. At the same time, she was also very angry that he did not give up his old habit even after death. In utter disgust, she told him, 
you have not left your bad habit even after death? Strange! I don't want to see your face. So saying, she came back into the house. Subama's husband had a second wife by name Kamalamma. She is here in the Prashanti Nilayam Mandir even now. I called her and told her, Kamalamma, you may also go and see your late husband once. But she refused, saying, Swami, we are here in your divine presence, happily spending our time. We don't wish for anything else. I, however, insisted and said, Just go once, see him and come back. When Kamalama went and saw him, he was drinking hot coffee. He was indulging in the same actions as he used to do when he was alive. Similarly, Lord Krishna also had shown some incidents of the past to his contemporaries. Subama engaged herself in the service of Swami till her last breath. Though she had no blood relationship with me, she was intimately attached to me mentally and spiritually. She was constantly contemplating on me. She requested Swami to stay only in her house. In fact, she offered to vacate her house and give it to Swami. Her relatives used to argue with her. You are a Brahmin lady and he is a Kshatriya boy. Why do you allow him into your house? She would stoutly oppose their argument and firmly declare, I don't need any of you. I will not come to your houses and you need not come to my house. If only Swami is with me, that is enough for me. She had only one desire to be fulfilled by me. She prayed, Swami, during my last moments of life, I must have the good fortune of witnessing your beautiful face. I promised her that her wish would be fulfilled. Once, the devotees from Madras, Chennai, pressurized me to visit that place urgently. Those were the days of Second World War. Once in every hour, there used to be an air raid siren making the streets empty in no time. I could not return to Puttaparthi early in those circumstances. In the meanwhile, the condition of Subhama turned serious. She was taken to her parents' house in Bukkapatnam. She breathed her last there itself. Her body was kept in the front veranda covered with a cloth. All the members of the family were immersed in sorrow. Her mother and relatives were very sad. The relatives said, Sai Baba gave word that he would pour a few drops of water in her mouth before she breathed her last. Now, she really breathed her last. But where is Sai Baba? He has not come even to have a last look at her. No one knows where he has gone. In those days, there was no motorable road to Puttaparthi. I had to come to Bukapatnam by car from Madras and from there to Puttaparthi in a bullock cart. By the time I reached Bukapatnam, I noticed that several people had gathered on the road. They appeared to be in a sorrowful mood. I inquired from one gentleman, What happened? He replied, Swami, yesterday night, Karanam Subhama left her body. Till her last breath, she was chanting, Sai Ram, Sai Ram. They are now making arrangements for taking her body to the cremation ground. In those days, firewood and such other articles to cremate a dead body were not readily available in the village. Hence, firewood had to be collected and made ready for the purpose. I again inquired, Where is Subama now? He replied, Swami, her dead body has kept in the veranda of her mother's house. I had a hearty laugh. I neither forgot my promise to Subama, nor did she. I asked the bullock cart driver to take it to Subama's house. There, all arrangements were being made to take her body to the cremation ground. All the people gathered in the veranda were weeping. They told me, Swami, Subama was chanting only your name till her last breath. Then I inquired, Where has she gone? As if I did not know anything. They informed me, Swami, the doctors came here and examined her. They confirmed that there was no life in her. 
since they were Brahmins, they did not allow anybody to come near Subama's dead body. Subama's mother and sisters wept loudly the moment they saw me. They started showering ironical praise on me, saying, Baba, Subama had great hopes till her last moment that you would come and pour a few drops of water in her mouth. She anxiously waited for your darshan. Finally, she breathed her last, greatly disappointed, having served you for so long. Could you not fulfill her last desire at least? Is this the reward for her loyal service? I told them tersely, She has not died. You keep quiet. They could not believe my words. They queried, How do you presume that she is not dead? Ants are crawling all over her body. There is no life in her body. Is it not true? But I silenced them saying, I gave word to her that I would pour a few drops of water in her mouth at the time of her leaving the body. I will never go back on my word. Subama's mother was a centenarian. I told her to bring some water with a few leaves of tulsi, basil plant dipped in it. I went near the body of Subama and removed the cloth covering the body. I called her, Subama, Subama. She opened her eyes slowly and held my hands tightly. She shed tears of joy and gratitude. Everyone witnessing that scene was wonderstruck. They shouted in one voice, Subama came back to life. That was in fact not true. What had actually happened was Subama came back to life only for my sake. Since I gave a word to her that had to be fulfilled. She inquired, Swami, when did you come? I replied, Subama, I came just now. Thus, when she opened her eyes and started talking to Swami, all her relatives hurriedly went inside the house to make arrangements for Swami's stay and lunch. But I told them firmly, You need not make any preparations for my food. I have come to see Subama. I have seen her. Now, I will go straight to Puttaparthi. I held the hand of Subama and inquired, What are you thinking about? She replied, I am chanting, Sai Ram, Sai Ram, Sai Ram, Swami. She shed tears of joy. I wiped her tears with my handkerchief. Holding my hand with great joy, she expressed her feelings thus, Swami, how nice of you to have come all the way to fulfill your promise made to me long ago. You still remember that promise, Swami? How compassionate you are! Satya Sai is not the type of person who goes back on his word. His very name is Satyam. What he speaks and acts upon is also Satyam, true. In the meanwhile, Subama's mother, younger brothers, sisters and the doctors, all people came in. They thought, how is it that Subama is talking all the while? How is it possible? There was no breath in her body since last night. What a wonder! Maybe this is Sai Baba's miracle. Subama held my hand and put it on her forehead. Then, I created some vibhuti and applied it on her forehead. I told her, Subama, all the worry you had till now has been removed, is it not? You were worried that Swami was not by your side in your last moments. Now, you have seen Swami and heard his words. You have also held his hand. I am now going to Puttaparthi. You close your eyes peacefully. She said, Thank you, Swami. Thank you. You go to Puttaparthi after sending me to my final abode. I told her, Now you close your eyes peacefully. I then poured a few drops of Tulsi water in her mouth. Thus, I kept up my promise. She put both her hands on my feet. I bade goodbye to her saying, Subama, I have fulfilled my promise made to you. Now, you can go happily. Subama then left her mortal coil saying, What more do I require Swami? 
I am leaving the body happily. Sai Ram, Sai Ram. All the while, she was shedding tears of joy, holding my hands. Thus, she attained salvation. Once I give word to someone, I will never forget. I will always abide by my word. Many people cannot believe this truth. They think, Ah, Swami is saying something just casually. My word will never go waste. Whatever I say, I will act accordingly. This is the truth. The dead body of Subhama was taken to the cremation ground. It was placed on the funeral pyre, and a younger brother lit the pyre. Strangely, her face remained serene till her entire body was consumed by the flames. That created a sensation in the village and became the talk of the village. I started on my return journey from Bukkapatnam to Puttaparthi, for which a bullock cart was kept ready. The brother of Graham Ammai, Ishwaramma, Chandramauli, was with me in the bullock cart. We saw smoke emanating from the cremation ground where Subhama's mortal remains were being consigned to flames. Chandramauli then asked me, Swami, you were by the side of Subhama's dead body till now. Why did you not wait till the cremation was over? I told him, Chandramauli, I am not a person who goes back on his word. I gave word to Subhama that I would be present by her side during her last moments and pour water into her mouth. That I fulfilled. I blessed her to depart from this world peacefully. I kept my promise and came out. Chandramauli felt very happy and commented, Swami, how compassionate you are towards the devotees. In fact, words fail to describe your compassion. True, words fail to describe Swami's love and compassion towards Subhama. Similarly, the devotion and surrender of Subhama towards Swami are indescribable. Her devotion surpassed even that of Prahlada. People had by now come to know about the news that Swami had fulfilled the promise given by him to Subhama and brought her back to life and put water in her mouth during her last moments. The very next day, people came in large numbers in cars one after the other. They started talking among themselves. It seems Subhama was brought back to life by Swami. It seems Sai Baba poured water into her mouth during her last moments. The entire house of Subhama was filled with these people. Everyone present there praised the good fortune of Subhama. There was only one word on the lips of everybody. Sai Baba fulfilled his promise. Subhama's life has become sanctified. From that day onwards, several elderly people started visiting me with the request, Swami, please give word to us also. You must pour sanctified water into our mouths at the time of our departure from this world. However, I had to tell them, My dear ones, all people cannot get this great boon. If you are destined to get it, you will certainly get it. I will come at the appropriate moment and pour sanctified water into your mouth.